Welcome back there, boys and girls. It's been a long hiatus, but it's time for Flip Class. We're going to talk about some plants today. Just a few basics to just, you know, strengthen the concepts, things we already know about plants, and sort of extend some of the things we don't necessarily know about plants. So that way, whilst we're talking about plants, I can just throw these terms out there and you will know what they are and we will not have to stop and re-explain them again. Is there glare from my glasses? I think there is, so they're going off and in the pocket. Here we go. Reproduction. Plants uh, are weird. They have the ability, many of them, to do sexual and asexual reproduction. And many of them uh, actually go in stages. Some plants can actually rely on asexual reproduction. For example, there's a strawberries. However, their primary means of reproduction is the plant sexy times, talking about sexual reproduction. If you've been outside and you're like, oh, my allergies, yeah, that's because of the plant sexual reproduction. We'll talk more on that a little bit later. Now, when they're doing their reproductiveness, they go through this alternation of generations. So they start out with what we call the gametophyte generation. The gametophytes, obviously, make the gamete because phyte meaning plant, gamete meaning gamete, so that's the gamete plant. And then that grows up to be a sporophyte. And I'll bet you can guess what the sporophyte does. That's right, the sporophyte, phyte still being plant, makes the spores. The spores are haploid, they grow into a new generation of gametophyte, and the cycle continues. So when you're looking at like one plant and its other generation, you're actually looking at two separate individuals of the same species. It'd be like if I had a kid and then the kid had another me, and then that one had another kid, and then that one had another, but it's not me, it's, it's another me that's similar, yeah, it's weird. Here's a picture that maybe, may or may not make it make any more or less sense. We're going to talk about this more in depth, I just want to get this idea sort of in your brain sickles. <clears throat> You got 2N, that's diploid, that's our sporophyte generation. Most of the plants you see outside are in the sporophyte generation. Look at a beautiful oak tree, that is the sporophyte. It goes through its diploid generation, it does meiosis here to make little haploid spores because that's how you go from diploid to haploid. So here are the spores, which are N, they begin the gametophyte generation, which is haploid, it's N, it has half the DNA. It grows, it develops, it does its thing, it actually does mitosis to make the gametes, which is true, so it'll be an explanation point. It's weird, I know, because we've learned that gametes are made by meiosis, except in plants, the gametes are made by the haploid gametophyte. The whole organism only has half the DNA. So it does mitosis to make the little sperm and the egg. And so you'll often have male gametophytes and female gametophytes to make the respective sperm and or ovum. And then, you know, they come together for a little bit of plant sex, talking about fertilization. And that restarts your diploid generation, grows into a beautiful sporophyte, does meiosis, makes spores grows into a beautiful gametophyte, does mitosis, makes gametes, and on and on and on and so on and so forth, etc, etc. Plants also have a really unique metabolism. We talked about this a little bit, so just a quick refresher. Remember, they do the photosynthesis to make their own food. With that food, they do cellular respiration just like we do to make their ATP. And just like all other ATP, that is the majority of chemical reactions, blah, blah, blah. Now plants were the first things to ever be on the land. And being the first things ever on the land, they had to make certain adaptations because like you just learned, all life originated in the ocean. Unless you're an overachiever and you're watching this before you learned that. But there, let the cat out of the bag. All life began in the ocean. Plants were the first things to ever come on land. Think about succession. Think about how we need to have those plants in there to colonize, to change the soil, blah, blah, blah. So if you're a plant and you need to survive on the land, you're no longer floating in water. So you need to find some way to get that water and some way to keep that water. Very, very important because, you know, water is the solvent of life and the majority of every living thing, pretty much, that I've ever learned about is water. 
In addition to that, you need to deal with gas exchanges. Gas exchanges are going to be a little different now because you're not floating in water, you're floating in air, a lot lower viscosity. Still a fluid, but gases will diffuse off of your body much more readily, especially water in the form of a vapor. Right, that, that water vapor, we're talking about transpiration. Plants can't be losing that water all the time, so then gas exchange plays a big part in that. Now you can't just float around in a beautiful a buoyancy sustaining solution of the ocean, so you need to find some way to anchor into the ground and resist things like the wind and other stuff that could rip a plant up and you know do bad things to it, like we've seen in the last few days. And then there's also others. So let's deal with the easiest ones first. Anchoring the ground, obviously, roots. Some of them have highly reduced roots. We're gonna look at some plants, uh, first and foremost, that don't even technically have a true root. But yeah, they all have to have some kind of anchoring thing. They have to have some way to acquire water. And again, that's the roots. They have that special conductive tissue. We'll talk about that when we get to vascular plants. Talking about xylem, phloem, blah, blah, blah. Don't ask any questions about those in the Moodle or I will delete it. And then they also need to have some way to retain that water. The leaves are spongy so water can easily escape. So we want to make sure that there's some way to keep that water in there so the plant doesn't die. All right, plants need to exchange those gases. They have waterproof covering called the cuticle over their leaves. But that doesn't allow them to do the whole CO2O2 exchange dealio with their cellular respiration and also their photosynthesis. The cuticle will stop all that. It's this waxy covering. Sometimes you may feel a plant feel its leaves feel like really thick and stiff and they feel like they're coated in wax. You put droplets of water on there and they bead up just like the plant leaf has been sealed because the plant leaf has been sealed by this thing called the cuticle. So they have these tiny holes in there called stoma or stomata, or sometimes I've even seen stomate. Remember, that's one of our science words, stone meaning mouth. So they have these little itty bitty tiny mouths that they can open or close to breathe out of. Which makes sense because if you sit here, a mouth breathing all day, you probably get incredibly thirsty. And then have to awkwardly drink a lot of water. So anytime you have these holes open, you're going to be losing water vapor. The plant will get thirsty. So it opens those and shuts them at opportune times to maximize the exchange of CO2 and oxygen, but to minimize the loss of water vapor. For more on that, watch this cool video that Veritasium did about them abusing their ability of releasing water vapor. But here's essentially how it works. You have these uh, stomates, which are little holes, and on the sides of them are guard cells. The guard cells determine whether or not it will be open or closed, and it actually works based on turgidity. So when the plant doesn't have very much water, the cells, uh, they, their normal shape is to be closed. And when the guard cells become very turgid, they pop and they make this shape that allows for the plant to lose some water because if these things are turgid, that means that they're in a hypotonic solution. There's more water coming in than going out, which for plants is a good thing because of the cell wall, but then it's okay to have the stermata open. Here is slide cell. You can actually see this is from an actual leaf. You took a little razor cutting out, bloop, looked down under a microscope. We're gonna look at some leaves under microscopes. You did already, and some of you guys probably noticed weird things like this. Here are your two guard cells with your stomate in the middle. That'd be a B. That green doesn't show up too well, so now it's blue. C would be the nucleus, and A is pointing to the two guard cells. So that's just a really quick intro into plants and to some of their uh, different adaptations to exist on land. Make sure you put your participation in the Moodle Patient. Links in the description. Thanks for watching, everybody.